well-known verse uh, in this chapter, and it's one that I'm afraid has been misused quite a bit over the years, and so it might be kind of tough to preach a lot of what you've heard uh, out of you in one, in one message, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I, I love this verse. In the, I think it's a great verse in the Bible, but I also think it's one that's often misused. It's one that's often thrown in people's face because you know they're not living up to our expectations as a Christian. And so, you know, it's like, you know, they'll maybe somebody gets saved and they don't change as quick as we think they ought to change. Not everything's going in their life the way we think it should be going. And so what do we do? All right. You know, we can't get these people to start acting like Baptists. We can't get them in church regularly. You know, yeah, they're saved. We can't scare them with hell anymore. So what are we supposed to do? Well, let's throw, you know, if any man being, if, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You know, if you haven't changed, you didn't really get saved. You know, and so what does it say? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you know, that is exactly what it says. But listen, when it says all things are become new, you know, what, you know, what does all mean in that situation? Well, it means all, right? Well, did your car become new? Or, you know, did all your clothes become new? I mean, did, uh, you know, I mean... Now, obviously, it's, it's, there's something specific that that's talking about, okay? It's not, you know, all things. And what we'll kind of do is we'll just kind of take that to mean whatever we want. And then, you know, normally in a typical Baptist church, I'd preach I would this message. I would give you this one verse, all things become new. And then I would preach an alliterated message on things that should become new in the life of a Christian, you know? And then, you know, we, uh, you know, the things you used to do, don't do them anymore. You know, we'd sing that song, maybe, you know, the things you used to smoke, you don't smoke, you know, you know, and I, I, I can just, I can rip on whatever I want to after that. All right. Cause I got my text verse, all things become new and just everything that I don't like that people do, man, I'm ready to preach on it. And I got Bible to back it up because all things become new. But what is that talking about specifically? Because, you know, there's other verses in the Bible that talks about how we're, just, we're not justified by the works of the law. You know, and yet that's what people are doing when they hold this verse against someone who has gotten saved but maybe aren't living like they should. They'll start saying, you know, it says all things have become new. So therefore, you know, you're going to have a changed life. Okay, well, okay, fine. If it, but if it means that, okay, you know, they'll say things, well, you know, you'll quit your drinking. All right, fine. But what about, uh, you know, what about gossip? You know, gossip's something that we're not supposed to do anymore. Does that mean you're never going to gossip again? What about losing your temper? Because it says all things are going to become new. Does it mean you're not going to have a temper anymore? You know, you're never going to cuss again. You know, you're, you're never going to, you're never going to miss church. You're never going to think a bad thought. It says all things become new, but it's like we do. We all just kind of pick you know, our favorite sins, and then we like to harp on that, and we hold people to it. We start making them doubt their salvation, and we'll use that verse of Scripture. But that's not fair. You know, what things are become new? What exactly is this? And, and once again, I say this all the time, and I'm going to say it again. You know, we tend sometimes to just take one verse, and we zero in on that one verse, and we just make it mean whatever we want it to mean. But we got to zoom out. You got to look at the verses before it. You got to look at the verses after it. You have to look at the context of what it's talking about to get the full understanding. You got to read more than just one verse a day and even just one chapter a day. Sometimes you got to read multiple chapters to get the full context. Sometimes you got to look at the whole Bible in order to get the full context of something. But let's go ahead and start reading through chapter 5 and I'll, and then I think you'll see very clearly what this is talking about and it turns out it actually kind of uh, what the way people are interpreting this passage is absolutely just dead wrong, and they're misusing it greatly. But we'll start reading in verse 1. It says, for, for ye know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. 
For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should, would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. We see here in this passage, he's talking about we have, okay, we have this tabernacle right here, and this tabernacle is sinful. This, ten, this, has a, this tabernacle, this body, it has a fallen nature, and it's saying here, we groan and we're, to be clothed with another tabernacle, with another house, one made without hands. What is that other tabernacle that it's talking about? Well, I believe it's talking about our new and glorified body. We'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, they, now here in 2 Corinthians, they knew all about this. Paul had written this to them before in his last letter. But he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay? We haven't been changed yet into our glorified body. That has not happened yet, but it's going to happen. And it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So then when this corruptible shall have put on incorrupt, incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus. So right here, we see that you know, as believers, we're saved, but we still are in a sinful condition, aren't we? We still have a sinful body. And one of these days, we're going to be, our body is going to be changed into a body like His glorious body. This corruptible is going to put on incorruption. And when that happens, then she'll be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. And it said, and right now we are clothed upon, you know, with mortality. But one of these days it's going to, that, uh, you know, but we're going to be clothed upon with that immortality. That's something that's, that's going to come. And it has not happened yet, but we are, we are still in this sinful condition. And just, you know, proof of that, if you're not sure, you know, do any of you in here still sin? Well, if you, why are you shaking your heads? Yes. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? Old things are passed away, but all things become new. Sinning is what you used to do, right? Well, no, we still sin because we still have this vile body. Okay, so we, that's not what that's talking about uh, in, in verse 17. So we see here in this same chapter, he's talking about how we have that desire to be clothed upon with that tabernacle or that house that's made without hands, we're specifically talking about our new body that we are going to receive when Jesus Christ returns. For those of us who die, it's, we're going to receive that at the resurrection. And if those of us who are alive and remain to the coming of Christ, we're going to receive that when we see Him. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God... And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So I can't... See, I, I'm not looking at the finished product right here. What I'm seeing right now is not the finished product. It doth not yet appear what ye shall be. I don't know what you're going to look like one of these days, but I do know this. I know right now we're the sons of God. If you've believed on Christ, you are saved today. Even though you are still in a sinful condition, you are still saved. You are still on your way to heaven. And I know that when He appears, you're going to be like Him. How do I know that? That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible says. But that day has not come yet. We are not there yet. I have not seen Jesus Christ in the flesh yet. And therefore, I still am in this physical body. I'm walking by faith and not by sight right now. So it's very clear here in chapter 5, that we are still sinful and we are still in a sinful condition in our body. And then so re, uh, look at verse 5. It says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body 
and to be present with the Lord. As believers, it's our desire to be absent from the body so we can be at home with the Lord. We want that. You know, we're right now, you know, we're, you know, we are, we're still in this sinful condition. We don't want to be sinful. Okay. But we are. And, you know, we can, tr- you can try the best you can and sin's always going to be present with you. And that's why, and you know, we got to learn it's a constant struggle. It's a daily thing to, for us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and for us to walk in the spirit. So we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we it, it's a constant struggle. And the truth is, none of us have seen Christ yet. We've not seen Him yet. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. He, the Bible, God said He's given us the earnest of the Spirit. He's given us the first part. He's given us that first part of our inheritance. He's given us the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us, but we don't have the new body yet. I don't have the new tabernacle yet. I'm still in the old tabernacle and so I, until then, I struggle with sin, but that Holy Spirit, he dwells with us. He keeps us safe, but we're living by faith. He said in there, we walk by faith and not by sight. I'm trusting in God's word. I'm trusting in the work of Jesus Christ to get me to heaven, not my own works. And do you understand when you tell somebody, you know what? I don't like how you, how little you change since you've got saved. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things become new. You know what they start to do? They start to look at themselves for salvation. Oh man, I'm not being good enough. You know, oh man, I, you know, if I'm going to have confidence in my salvation, I've got to quit doing this and I've got to start doing that. And listen, salvation is all about the work of Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's all about putting your faith and trust in his work and what he did and And that's something that we believe by faith. I believe that Jesus paid it all. I believe He paid every bit of it. I believe He did the work. I believe that salvation comes by believing on Him and that it is without works. And I believe that I'm saved today. Why? Not because of my changed life, but because God's Word tells me that I am. And I'm walking by faith not by sight, when we start talking about people's actions and the changes in their life, that right there, it's getting people to walk by sight. Look at sight. We're walking by faith is what it says very clearly in that passage. And we are, we are still living by faith. And you know what? It's always been that way when it comes to salvation. Habakkuk 2.4 Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. It taught that back in the Old Testament. That was repeated in Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11 But no man is justified by the law and the sight of God. For it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And it's mentioned again in Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. We don't prove we're saved. I'm not going to... I shouldn't be... Uh, trying to prove to you or myself or anyone else that I'm saved by my keeping of the works of the law because the Bible says by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I'm always going to fail when it comes to my keeping of the law. I'm always going to come short when it comes to my keeping of the law. And so the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Their faith and our faith is in the work of Jesus Christ. And so we get saved just like they got saved in the Old Testament by grace, through faith, without works. And you understand the way I was using verse 17, the way we throw that at people, we're making all of a sudden, we're making salvation about works. And that's completely inappropriate. And it flies in the face of everything we've read so far here in chapter 5. So, showing just you know what a misuse that is. So look at verse 9. It says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So we see a couple things here that uh, might make you nervous a little bit. First of all, notice that it says, Wherefore we labor. It says we're laboring to be accepted of Him. Now doesn't that fly in the face of it's not about works? 
What's that talking about right there? So, well, first off, you know, as believers with the hope of eternal life, we are supposed to be living in a way and striving to please God, shouldn't we? We ought to do good works, okay? We were not saved by works, but we were saved unto good works. When you get saved, God wants you to change your life. God wants you to do good. God wants you to get baptized. He wants you to go to church. You know, He wants you to give any offering. He wants you to love your neighbor. He wants you to go soul winning. God wants you to do all those things, but God didn't make any of those things a requirement for salvation. And none of those things, none of those works make us acceptable to God. However, we see here in this passage though, it says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, okay, we may be accepted of him. All right. So how do we labor to be accepted of God if we cannot be accepted by the works of the law? Well, here's, here's the thing. Who is he writing to in, in here in Corinthians? He's not writing to lost people. He's writing to save people. He's writing to believers. He's writing to people who have already been made accepted. They've been made accepted through Jesus Christ. Okay? What's he talking about here? Then he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But wait, who all, who all appears before the judgment seat of Christ? Do lost people appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Absolutely not. Lost people are going to appear before a, 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 the great white throne. Of judgment, not the judgment seat of Christ. The judge, I think everyone agrees that the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. That's where the saved people are going to be judged by God. But understand, everyone who stands before the judgment seat of Christ and is judged, a hundred percent of those people are going to go into heaven, just like a hundred percent of people who stand before the great white throne of judgment and are going to be judged are going to go to hell. See, this is uh, that right here what this is talking about. This is not talking about being acceptable for salvation. But this is talking about whether or not we're going to get rewarded or not. Okay? And I've said it before, I'll say it again. Salvation is free. Therefore, if we work, if we labor for God, He owes us rewards. Because salvation was free. And so we don't owe God a life of service because we are saved. Okay, Now, we should give God a life of service, but we don't owe it to Him. If we owed it to Him, then salvation wasn't free. But salvation was free, and so God blesses us. And God, and God rewards us greatly. I mean, when you read about the, you know, the rewards that God gives in heaven, you know, Jesus talked one time about receiving a hundredfold. Really, I mean, a hundredfold for the labors we do. Why? We don't deserve that. God's just a good God. He wants to reward us. He wants to give us good things. And so he does. He, he pays us well. He, pay, he, pays us, he pays his servants real well. So right here, you know, as, as um, you know, we're not laboring to be saved, but we're laboring because we're going to stand before him and we want to be rewarded. I want God to be pleased with the works I've done. I want to receive rewards for the works I've done. See, our, you know, our salvation should never cause us to be arrogant. You know, there's nothing about the fact that we're saved that should make us arrogant. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything for it. So why would we be arrogant? Why would we get lifted up with pride? Because we're saved. It's been offered to everybody. Anybody can be saved. Whosoever will may come. So why would we get puffed up? Why would we get, why would we get arrogant about salvation? There's no reason to and our, and our salvation, it shouldn't cause us to be careless in our behavior. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. Let me show you a passage over here in Romans chapter 6. You see, a lot of people, they have this attitude that because we believe salvation is without works, because we believe that you don't have to do works to keep your salvation, that it's like, you know, we've just got this you know, free license to sin. But it says also there in 2 Corinthians 5, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay, it's, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We understand we are going to have to face off of them one of these days. We're going to stand before Him face to face and we're going to answer for the things that we have done. And so you, listen, if you want to live like the devil while you're saved, you can and still go to heaven. 
But you're going to stand before Jesus Christ one of these days, and I promise you will regret it. I promise you will greatly regret it. You will be sorry. In fact, I believe you'll be sorry before you even stand before him because sin brings misery. Sin brings heartache. Your life's going to stink if you don't live for God. If you don't change your life, you're going to live a sorry existence here on this earth and you're going to stand before God and you're going to have no rewards. And you're going to be greatly sorry. So let me tell you, there is no license to sin here just because of the fact we don't have to worry about going to hell. But it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. We see here in this passage that, you know, as believers that are in Christ, that Jesus Christ, he conquered sin for us. We don't have to sin. Okay? And when you do, when you sin, when you mess up, it's because you sinned and you messed up. And you didn't have to do that. You know, we can, we can be victorious over sin in our life. There's a lot of lost people out there that just can't seem to get victory over sin in their life. They just can't seem to get victory in any area. But as believers, we don't have an excuse. We have Christ in us. Now, is it anywhere in that passage, is it guaranteed that 100% of the time you'll always have success? No, but it does guarantee success is available if we'll take it, but we don't always take it. And that's very clear throughout the scriptures that sometimes we do, sometimes we choose to walk in the flesh. And when we do, we fulfill the lust of the flesh. But victory is always there. Whenever we don't have victory, it's because we rejected victory. Jesus Christ has gotten victory over sin and victory is always available. Whatever sin you're struggling with in your life, if you're not getting victory, it's not because victory is not available. It's because you're rejecting victory. It's because you're choosing to walk in the flesh rather than the Spirit, and you have no excuse for that. One of these days when you stand before Christ, He's going to ask you why you didn't get victory over those things in your life. Why you couldn't get victory over that flesh because He provided what you needed. He conquered sin for you on the cross. He gave you the Holy Spirit. And you will. You will regret not getting victory over that sin. We have no excuse to continue living a life of sin. We ought to be, we ought to do the right thing. But I'm here today to tell you that it's not going to happen 100% of the time to 100% of the people. And you have no business going and pointing at other people and based on their works, Saying they're saved or not saved. You, and using 2 Corinthians 5.17 in that way. That's, there's just, it's, there's not a guarantee. In fact, when you look at the Bible, when it talks about those who are not saved, you know, people who say they are saved or not saved, you know what it tells you to go off of? It's not, it's not their works, it's their doctrine. You know, whoever confesses that Jesus is not the Christ, he is antichrist. It talks about things like that. You know, whoever says you know, Jesus is not born of God, it's always doctrinal things. It never talks about works. It's always doctrinal things. And so you might hear me do that occasionally. I'll talk about some false prophets. I'll talk about how they're on their way to hell. Well, what are you judging that off? I'm judging off their doctrine. And the Bible says that many times, but that's not what most people do today. They usually go off of works. And we need to look at their doctrine. That is, a, that is a much clearer way to tell who's saved and who's not saved. That person that's out there, when, we're, when we go out soul winning, you know, sometimes I'll knock on the door and I'll see somebody and I'm looking at them. And I'm, you know, flesh steps in and you might judge them a little bit, size them up. All right, this person needs to get saved from the looks of them. But then you talk to them and turns out they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
Now they haven't got a lot of victory over the sin in their life. It's very clear. But it's very but it's also clear when you talk to them that their faith is in the work of Jesus Christ. Well, according to the Bible, that person's saved. Then there's other people, looks like they've got all their act together. They're doing all the works. You ask them what they're trusting in, they're trusting in their good works. Well, according to the Bible, that person's not saved. And so we see throughout the Bible that the proof whether someone's saved or not, in any what we're what we have to go off, we're supposed to go off their doctrine, what they're saying, not their works. Not the things they're, they're doing. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it's constantly used to go after people's works to prove that they're not saved. And that's just, that's not, that's not appropriate. And so, you know, our, um, you know, the terror of the Lord, I think it's like the terror we had as children of our parents. Okay? You know, there were many times when I was terrified them. Terrified of them. I never thought I was going to stop being their son, but I'm like, you know, this will not please my mom and dad. This will bring chastisement from mom and dad. And we all know what that's like. And because we are children of God, we're going to receive the chastening of God. If you want to call the chastening of God license to sin, go right ahead. But listen, I believe in eternal security. I don't believe in license to sin, but I do believe even if we sin, we're still saved and... I, I say it all the time, if the chastening of God is licensed to sin, then you know what? We have license to speed. We just got to pay the $75 or whatever the ticket is. You know? There, you know? We've got license to do all kinds of things. If we're willing to pay the fine, I'm for, I've, I've got license to go rob a bank as long as I'm willing to do the time. If I get caught, you know? That's, that's just ridiculous, okay? That's not license. You know, that ticket is not licensed to speed. Okay? They're doing that because they want you to stop speeding. Not so you can't, I'm not paying $75 so I can speed. Okay? If I do that, I'm, you know, they'll just keep giving me tickets if I keep doing that. So, you know, that is, that's, that's a, that's a terrible, ridiculous argument from people who want to force works as a part of salvation. And you know what? Those people are never going to go away. As long as there's a devil, there will always be people teaching a works-based salvation. It was going on. It's been going on since Cain. It's never going to go away. We just got to keep on preaching the truth. They're always going to be out there. But look at verse 12. It says, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Many mistakenly, they do, they glorify, or they glory in their changed life, not understanding that it's God's grace is still on them every day. Every day. God is gracious to us. And they do. They will glory in appearance. Okay? I love seeing the BC pictures. I love seeing the pictures of people before Christ, before they got saved. I like seeing the pictures of the men when they were long haired hippies, you know, before they got saved. You know, or, you know, the way they used to dress or look before they got saved. I, I, I think it's great. It's a testimony about how the Holy Spirit can change somebody. I like seeing that. I like hearing the testimonies. About the people, you know, and the, you know, the things they used to do, they don't do anymore. I like those things. But you understand that if we're not careful, we can start glorying in those things. We can start glorying in our change. And we can get to where we talk about ourselves so much, we forget how we got saved. We forget that we got purged from our old sins. There's a lot of preachers that are out there that they were, they were bad guys before they got saved. They did a lot of wicked things. And they got saved and God changed their life. And over time, it's like they forgot how they got saved. They forgot that they got saved by grace through faith. They forgot that it was without works. And all of a sudden, they now expect everyone to be like them that get saved. And you all understand, the best preacher in America, God didn't save any of you to even be like them. God saved you to be like Jesus Christ. There is no man that's the standard, and but that's what people are doing. You know, they're judging based on, well, you know, when I got saved, I changed this fast. You know, I mean, I, right away I got into church. Right away I started doing this. I quit doing that. Not everybody is the same way with that. 
And they do. They start glorying in the flesh. And that is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Look, uh, and then uh, look at verse... Um, well, you know, we, do, we often judge who is saved by those outward things. But, you know, the obedience of a believer, it's something that comes from the heart. And we see that there in that verse. You know, the love of Christ constraineth us. You know, and we do where, you know, the love that he shows us, the goodness that he showed us, it causes us to want to live for him. It causes us to want to do good for him. And look what it says in verse 16. It says, wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. What does that mean? Well, when it's saying, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. This isn't about anyone in the flesh, okay? This is, we're not, we don't know anyone in the flesh that we're trying to be like, even though we have known Christ in the flesh, but yet, yet now know we him no more. Jesus Christ is not here in the flesh anymore. He was, he was here in the flesh, but now he's not. So there is nothing, there is no body that we look at in the flesh that we pattern everything after, that we go off. There is no standard here on this earth, any person in the flesh that we can look to, and that's a Christian right there. That's what a person needs to be. If you're saved, you know, you got to be that right there. You got to be that person. No. This isn't about anybody in the flesh. Even though we have no Christ in the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more. He's not going to be here in the flesh anymore until he returns, and then we'll be like him then. So we're not, we're not going off those things. We're not lifting up anyone in the flesh. We have no individual here on this earth that we praise more than anyone else. We don't have a pope. We don't believe in a vicar of Christ here on this earth. We don't believe in any of those things. We don't have any of those things. I, as a pastor of this church, I am none of those things. We don't have those things. We have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the one that we go off of. He is the standard, and we have His Word that is where we learn about Him and where we find out how to be like Him in His Word. And so there's often entire brands of Christianity that are designed off of people whose flesh we're impressed with. You know, we're impressed with that guy. You know, he, he's such a great example of a great Christian. And it's like everybody strives to be like that individual. And there's nothing wrong with us learning from other people, but we are, we're treading on dangerous ground when we have whole religions being formed kind of around an individual. And everybody's just trying to be like a person. Everybody's always talking about a person. We're supposed to be talking about Jesus Christ. And he's not going to share his glory with anyone else. And so we're not, we're not trying to be like anyone in the flesh. We're only trying to be like Christ. So then we get to verse 17. All right. So what does verse 17 mean? So, so uh, let's go ahead and read the rest of the passage. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So, verse 17, therefore, whenever you say that word, therefore, okay? What's the word therefore, therefore, all right? Well, we're supposed to be taking into context what was said before, all right? So, having said all the things that we saw before, uh, you know, we see things like the fact that we are still in this earthly tabernacle. We groan to be clothed with that, that tabernacle made without hands, that house made without hands, we look for that. We long for that. We're right now, we're walking by faith. We're not walking by sight. And so, you know, we, we're not going off of anybody in the flesh. We're following after Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things are become new. You know what this means? It means it's not about the flesh anymore. This is what's become new. It's not about the flesh anymore. No, because, you know, what is it that people were always trying to do in the Old Testament? They were always doing these cleansings, weren't they? 
They would do these cleansing. They would try to clean themselves up. They would have all these works and these laws that they would try to keep. Why? So they could be acceptable to God. They were always do it, trying to keep these laws and they were always failing. And what was it they were always looking at? You know, they're always looking at their flesh. You know, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to keep? And you know what? All things have become new. It's not about the flesh anymore. It's not about the keeping of the law anymore. It's not about what try or where you descend from. You don't have to be physically descended from a Jew. That has nothing to do with it anymore. It's not about, it's not about the flesh. That's what's become new. It is not about the flesh. And then also, those who are saved, they don't have their sins imputed unto them. Look at the very next thing it says um, in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Okay, what, that, That's a new thing. We're not paying for our sins. Jesus Christ paid for our sins for us, and we're not having our sins imputed unto us. So that right there, when you see that right there, you can't say, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and then hold that against people like you're not keeping the law good enough. Listen, one of the things that have become new is not that we don't do anything that we used to do. What has become new is now our sins aren't imputed unto us. Now, what has become new is, you know what, even though I was a sinner before and I'm still a sinner today, my sins are not imputed unto me. I am not under the wrath of God anymore. That's what's become new. The Bible teaches in John, you know, John 3.16, where, or, where it talks about God's love of the world. We all know that verse. And then it goes on, it says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those who have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says the wrath of God is on them. Well, why is the wrath of God on them? Because of the sin that is in their life. Well, what's different for us? Well, something's been made new for us. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, our sin is not imputed unto us. Therefore, we are no longer under the wrath of God. We are free from those sins. We are cleansed from those sins. And God sees us as righteous, even though we're still in the flesh and we're not perfect. Even though we still mess up and we still sin, something has been made new. Our sins are not imputed unto us. But what are people doing when they take 2 Corinthians 5.17 and use it in that way? They're imputing people's sins unto them. Saying you're still under the wrath of God because you have this and this and this sin in your life. No, if we believe on Him, we are not under the wrath of God anymore. That all, Why? Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm now a saved person. I now am a spiritual man. I am one that while still living in this tabernacle, still have sin... One thing that's new for me, my sins are not imputed unto me anymore. Listen, we're no better than people that are out there in the world. There's people, there's lost people I know that are better than some Christians that I know. But what's the difference? The just shall live by faith. We've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and something's been made new. Our sins are not imputed unto us. I'm not going to be held accountable for those sins. I will never spend one second in hell. Why? Because all things have been made new. Jesus Christ paid for my sins and those who are saved. Well, um, go ahead and turn over Romans chapter 4, verse uh, verse 3. I love this passage. Romans 4, verse 3. What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you're working for your salvation... Your reward, it's not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, God owes you, but we know salvation is by grace. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth this blessed, the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Does it say here, Blessed are they whose lives have been changed? Blessed are they whose li- who are so much better than the lost people now? No, it says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Okay, ble- uh, you know, um, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? 
when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteous of, of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. For years, the Jews, they thought that because they descended from Abraham, because of how they kept the law, they thought that they were righteous because of that. But Paul said, no, listen, Abraham had righteousness imputed to him before the circumcision. It was before that. And you know what? All those who are even uncircumcised today, they can be saved. Why? Because of the righteousness of faith. Just like Abraham got saved without the works of the law, we can be saved without the works of the law. And that is crystal clear in the Bible. And it was something that was throughout the Old Testament. David talked about it. You know, blessed are they you know, whose sins are not imputed unto them, who, you know, though whose iniquities are covered. Thank God for that. And so those of us who are saved today, while we still have our issues, one of the things that's been made new, we can still be used of God. It says in verse 19, to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. Yeah, you know what? I'm now a spiritual man. You know what has become new? My sins are imputed unto me. My iniquities are covered. I'm righteous before God. You know what else has become new? I can now be used of God. He has given me the word of reconciliation. He has made me an ambassador for Christ. How can God use me like that, even though I'm a sinner? Why? Because of Jesus Christ that's in me. Because I have been made a new creature in Christ. And it is crystal clear throughout that entire chapter, we're st we still got to mess with this flesh. It's a challenge. It's a problem. It's something that we constantly need to deal with. But that is not what that you know the change in our flesh is not what proves we're saved. It is not the thing that has become new. It's these specific things here that it mentions. And so if 1 Corinthians 5:17 was about a changed life, then why does it mention how those who are saved do not have their sins imputed unto them right after that? That's one of the first things it says right after that. Their sins are not imputed unto them. What does that mean? It means they still have sins. But they're not being held accountable for those things. Why? Because they're a new creature in Christ. They've been washed in His blood. But it's crystal clear they still sin. And so this is, this is what's new. I'm a child of God. I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit. My sins, they are not held against me. And I've been given the ministry of reconciliation. I'm an ambassador for Christ. Now, who gets the glory for that? Not me. I, got, I can only give God all the glory for that. And what do most people do when they take 2 Corinthians 5.17? Most pastors, they'll go, they'll read that one verse, and then they'll talk about all the things they change in their life. And why haven't you changed that in your life? What are they doing? They're glorying in their flesh. Which is complete... I mean, it flies in the face of what this entire chapter teaches. And that, folks, is why it's so important that we study our Bibles, and that why we get the full context of things. Because many t Christians today, they're not living the victorious Christian life because they're constantly looking in, at themselves. They're constantly working on themselves. They can't have the peace. They can't have assurance of their salvation because they're constantly focused on their own works instead of just the faith of Jesus Christ. And... And understand, the only thing that will help you get victory over this flesh, it's going to be faith. Because to get victory over the flesh, you have to walk by faith. You have to, and we, you have to walk in the Spirit. And if you, will not walk, if you will walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But what are most people doing today? How can I fi fix this flesh? How can I change this flesh? And they're all focused on the flesh. Well, if you're focused on the flesh, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And they're never getting victory. And God wants us to have victory. And it, but we're not going to 
until we get our doctrine right, until we get our mindset right on these things. So if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the way that, this is what that verse means. And that shouldn't upset you. That should excite any Christian. Any believer, that ought to excite them to hear those words. To know that my sins are not going to be imputed unto me. I'm thankful for that, and I hope you are too. So with that, let's all stand together.